Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Webb Brown. I'm really excited today to talk about how you can use Spinnaker and KubeCost to dynamically and continuously um, optimize Kubernetes workloads in order to reduce uh, waste or reduce uh, compute and, and overall cloud spend. So uh, I've got just a handful of slides to walk through, um, about five or six slides, and then I was going to turn over to a day where we're going to spend the bulk of the time on a, a demo actually seeing these two products uh, live. Um, and then finally, we're going to save times for, for any questions uh, that you have. So uh, a really quick background on ourselves. Uh, so like I mentioned, my name is uh, Webb Brown. I'm co-founder and CEO of KubeCost. Um, I am joined by Ajay, who is also a co-founder and the CTO of, of KubeCost. Um, we previously worked together at Google uh, for a long time, you know, thinking about uh, similar sorts of problems around uh, infrastructure monitoring and optimization. And then a high-level overview on KubeCost, uh, which is an open platform uh, for uh, cost management specifically built for teams running Kubernetes. Um, we help teams monitor and maximize the efficiency of spend um, when, again, like running a Kubernetes or set of Kubernetes environments. Um, a little bit more context, the uh, open source project was launched in 2019. Um, like I mentioned, our founding uh, team, you know, ha had been thinking about these problems for a long time, uh, both with like internal infrastructure at Google, as well as uh, Google Cloud and external developer tools. Um, KubeCost today is now deployed, deployed in more than a thousand different uh, Kubernetes uh, environments. Um, a, a lot of different, you know, variants, anything from like air gapped and, and you know, many on-prem environments. Um, to the big three cloud providers, AWS, GCP, and Azure, and then also a long tail of, of other environments. Um, and you know, KubeCost itself can be deployed in, um, you know, in minutes um, or, or less uh, is, you know, based on Apache open source KubeCost project. Um, there's, a, you know, a free community version, which we'll be you know, sharing today. Uh, and then there are also, you know, enterprise offerings built on top of that, uh, on top of those, you know, open uh, projects. So KubeCost itself really helps teams in three different areas. Uh, the first is around really just gaining visibility into spin. So helping teams understand, you know, what um, team, application, deployment, stateful set, et cetera, et cetera, um, any, you know, view of spend in a Kubernetes environment, and then the related spin outside of Kubernetes. So uh, resources like S3 or RDS or BigQuery, uh, actually able to like allocate those back to, those calls back to Kubernetes tenants. And then once teams have this visibility, uh, we really uh, help teams optimize uh, those uh, you know, workloads and kind of related you know, resources. Uh, so KubeCost itself delivers insights uh, that can be kind of statically applied or manually applied, and then also dynamically applied um, via tools like Spinnaker and others. Uh, and then finally, um, KubeCost helps teams kind of ongoing you know, govern uh, you know, cloud spend and waste. Um, here, there's a lot of functionality around like say, budgeting and alerts and recurring reports and you know, chargeback integrations, et cetera, uh, that re really help teams uh, keep a handle on uh, spend and its efficiency over time, oftentimes in like you know, larger organizations. Uh, so that's a really quick rundown on kind of three you know, major functionality areas for, for KubeCost. Um, now I'm going to talk about some of the kind of practical applications of this. Um, and the way KubeCost works today is it uh, integrates tightly with um, kind of name your own, you know, PromQL time series database as well as others. Um, so commonly using things like Prometheus and Thanos and Cortex. And then we build or KubeCost builds you know, a, a bunch of uh, ETL caching pipelines uh, on top of that database so that you can really efficiently uh, at large scale and over large uh, time windows uh, make really fast queries. And those fast queries can be made from uh, the open source kubectl cost plugin, um, made via you know, kubectl APIs, uh, made via the, the kubectl UI itself, which AJ is going to show, and then also you know, can be made via uh, tools like Armory and, and others. Um, 
So, you know, really important uh, for KubeCoffs to kind of bring the data to you, um, both the visibility and insights that you, um, you know, plan to apply into tools that you, uh, you know, regularly use, whether that's, you know, any of these Grafana, you know, existing, you know, BI or, or monitoring solutions. So specifically, how does uh, KubeCoffs uh, and Spinnaker work? And again, Jay is going to walk through this demo in great detail now. Uh, but this really starts with the you know, KubeCoffs uh, Insights API or, or Savings API. Um, this is uh, used to determine cost efficiency. Uh, once Spinnaker is going through its deployment pipeline, it actually uses those efficiency and determine thresholds and even context about your workloads to dynamically make a deployment decision uh, to uh, you know adjust resource requests or you know, resources provided to it by the Kubernetes scheduler. Um, and that can be done you know by when you manually build a pipeline or just done on a recurring basis. Um, and then you know that is actually you know configured via the Kubernetes control plane. Um, and then this process repeats itself. So uh, KubeCost is constantly collecting new metrics. Uh, by default, it scrapes data every one minute, but it actually can collect data more frequently. Um, and then you know, this pipeline or process can be run dynamically um, or, or manually, kind of based on, on your choosing. So that's a really quick rundown of kind of the high level components that Ajay is gonna be talking about. I will now turn it over to him uh, to walk us through kind of how these uh, tools integrate and operate together. Uh, so uh, take it away, Ajay. Hello, Ed. Hi, my name is Ajay, and I'm the co-founder and one of the original authors of the KubeCost project. Today, I'm going to show you how to leverage KubeCost and Spinnaker to save money. KubeCost starts by gathering cost and usage data for containers in your cluster then aggregating them to Kubernetes concepts. Here, we're looking at a breakdown by namespace, but we can also look at breakdowns by controller, service, pod, other custom labels, clusters. Here, there's only one cluster, and nodes. This should allow you to get a clear understanding of who's spending what on your infrastructure. Let's say, for example, you're responsible for a namespace called Acme Air. We can filter for it here and look at further breakdowns of the cost. Uh, you can see, for example, over the last seven days, Acme Air has spent 77 cents in CPU, 3 cents in RAM, 78 cents in persistent volumes, nine cents in network costs uh, and one dollar and 36 in other shared costs. Um, here on this cluster, we've decided to share the namespace cube dash system with all other namespaces. Uh, you can configure other, essentially any aggregation to be shared. Uh, however, we're only 7.7% efficient. Uh, what that means is for pods in Acme Air, CPU and RAM requests on average, are only being 7.9% cost weighted utilized. So about 7.9, if you added these two together, 77 cents and three cents, you got 80 cents. Um, only about seven cents of that is being utilized. It's about 7%. We can dive into a little bit more of what's happening here on the request sizing page. So here we can see we filtered by the namespace Acme Air and we've selected the production profile. Um, what that means is in production, uh, we recommend aiming for about 65% resource utilization to save some headroom for bursting. However, even with this notion of headroom, we can see that only six milli CPUs are being used and we've requested 100 milli CPUs. Uh, which means we're way over provisioned here. This is likely driving the majority of the inefficiency. Uh, although we can see we can make a small optimization by dropping our RAM request from 100 megabytes to 83 megabytes because we're only using 53. We could edit this into our kubectl config, 
But what about when this changes or for new versions or images or if uh, we get a sudden burst of traffic? Um, instead of manually updating this, we can create a Spinnaker pipeline to automatically adjust our memory and CPU requests. And we've done that here. The way we've done that is by creating a custom webhook that calls into the KubeCost API for recommendations, then automatically deploys those to uh, Acme Web. You can see here, uh, we make an API call with a couple of those target CPU and RAM utilizations we discussed earlier, um, as well as you know the window over which we want to uh, run our request sizing algorithm and the namespace and container name. Um, after that, after that, we receive a uh, a response from our API with the new with a new request uh, with a new suggested request that gets templated in that gets compared to uh, the existing request to make sure we're and uh, the existing request and a projected efficiency to make sure we continue to be efficient, and then it gets templated and deployed. So uh, let's give that a go right now. So I'm pulling up the Acme web pod to see what its current requests are to just confirm that it's requesting 100 CPU and 100 uh, milli CPU. if I can get this to cooperate. Acme Air, excuse me. Yes, so we can confirm that it's that it's still running at uh, 100 milli CPU and 100 MB. Let's quit that. Let's uh, kick off a manual execution of the pipeline. Uh, you can see the get efficiency query being issued and returning. with a new request here. Being compared to the existing and being deployed. So it should be done. Let's take a look. It's uh, been running for 31 seconds. And we can see the uh, recommendations have been applied. So in this demo, we've manually run the KubeCost get efficiency stage for the uh, of the and the whole deploy deployment pipeline. But you can, for example, add a cron trigger to update your requests or update your request your requests every time a new image is deployed or any of the other great things you can do. Uh, with Spinnaker or your CI CD uh, pipeline. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Ajay. So it looks like we've got a handful of questions here. Uh, I see at least three. Um, Thank you for the questions. And again, thank you everybody for joining. Um, so the first question that I see answered is, how do you calculate uh, cost efficiency? Um, and Jay and we spent most of our time talking about cost efficiency of a particular workload, uh, whether that be a, a pod, a deployment, a staple set, or something else. Um, and this is uh, the cost-weighted 
uh, like you know, measurement of the amount of resources that you have requested um, and therefore the Kubernetes scheduler has provisioned um, relative to the amount of resources that you are uh, utilizing. So if you're requesting a lot of CPUs, but you're you know, using a small fraction of them, uh, you are gonna have low cost efficiency. Um, and then if you are uh, you know, requesting, a, say, a relatively small number of CPUs, but you're using all of them, you're going to have high cost efficiency. Um, so, uh, like, the, the goal is not necessarily, depending on your use case, to always try to get to 100% cost efficiency. Um, it's about balancing the trade-offs between uh, cost and reliability and performance. Uh, so, for that example, uh, on CPU, um, if you have really high cost efficiency, uh, you may be at risk of being CPU throttled. Uh, and if this is a production application, you know, that may not at all be a good thing and may not be worth kind of extra cost savings. Um, so when a GA looks and presented these uh, cost efficiency measurements and then the recommendations, he would be taking into account um, those kind of, you know, more peak utilization or basically the distribution of your resource utilization over time. Um, really important concept when thinking about how to appropriately set these values. So again, you're not at risk of being CPU throttled or you know, evicted because of out of memory um, errors. And, and therefore, like, again, really, you know, just saying that context matters in the sense that like, um, you know, different workloads may have different relationships between uh, the goals of cost reduction and performance improvement. So hope that's helpful on, on kind of like talking about cost efficiency. Happy to share more there. Um, just let us know if there's a follow-up question. And then the next question is, uh, what is idle? Um, and how do you come up with that? Jay, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, yeah, so Anonymous asked, uh, what's idle? How do you come up with that? Um, so let, let's say you're running, uh, you know, just one workload in the cluster, right? And it's taking up one of your CPUs. Uh, you've requested one CPU and one gigabyte of RAM, and there's 10 CPU on the cluster um, what, and uh, 10 gigabytes of RAM. So what we're saying is idle here is the, those nine gigabytes that exist on the cluster but haven't been essentially requested or allocated to, uh, a particular, to your workloads. Um, so, and let's also say, for example, you've requested one CPU, but uh, at some point the pod bursts up to two CPU above the requests. Then, because we take the max of usage and requests uh, in our notion of allocation, we would then say the idle becomes eight CPU and nine gigabytes of RAM. Um, so, it's uh, you can essentially think of it as kind of like overhead that has not been allocated to any workload running in the cluster. Slightly different from the overhead between, uh, you know, for this cost efficiency metric, that overhead being the difference between what's actually being utilized and what's being requested by a workload. So that's kind of the difference between the cost efficiency number and the idle number. Um, but yeah, super, super awesome question. Um, yeah, and you know, ultimately, it's it's really kind of a measurement of you know your efficiency of of bin packing and also kind of you know uh, like cluster sizing. Um, there's actually some other insights uh, in the KuCost platform that Ajay didn't share, um, but actually get to that kind of you know on a cluster aggregate level, which is here we're looking at right sizing, um, you know, individual workloads or deployments, but also have those same insights too. Uh, right size your cluster in aggregate. Um, and again, the same thing would be true where we'd be looking at kind of the shape of you know, resource requirements over time, not just thinking about like median utilization, but really looking at kind of peak demand um, or, or you know, P99 demand, whatever's important in your environment. Yep. Um, Jesse asked, is there a multi-cluster aggregate view or way of understanding cost across a fleet of clusters? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, so uh, it kind of relates to um, another question in chat, which is, are you using the enterprise edition of KubeCost in the environment? Um, the answer was no, I was using the community edition as Webb pointed out. In the enterprise edition, uh, multi-cluster aggregates are supported. Um, you can either install a uh, Thanos, uh, which is a prom, uh, it's a Prometheus uh, durable storage endpoint for, that also does aggregation. Or if you've already got a Thanos installation, 
we can plug into that or uh, basically anything that speaks PromQL um, that you already do aggregation in, we can plug into that or you can install um, in our enterprise edition uh, Thanos or another multi-cluster aggregation uh, tool. Yeah, so so just recap on that. Um, like Jay mentioned, he's, he was using the like free community version. Um, and to add a little bit more to Pratik's question is that uh, you know all of the features we covered again are you know free, uh, built on the open source. Um, enterprise uh, additions would give you know the feature Jesse asked about, which is like you know multi cluster aggregation, but also long term metric retention and kind of like common enterprise functionality like. Are back and SAML, et cetera. Um, and Jesse, to like add a little bit more on what uh, Ajay shared there is um, when using solutions like Thanos or Cortex or you know even a host of Prometheus, um, that's a, in our view, a, a really nice way of doing multi cluster aggregation because you don't have to have cluster to cluster communication and worry about you know, firewalls or anything like that. Um, there are a number of other ways to do like multi cluster aggregation, but that's generally the, the recommended path. Um, and we're just finding that, you know, more and more teams have a Cortex or a Thanos or, you know, like federated Prometheus, et cetera, where they're already kind of, you know, sharing data across different environments. All right. So that is all the questions that I see. No, oh, we've got one you know, about uh, how we how we install this. So um, well, just do. So the question is, uh, do you have the code for the Spinnaker pipeline in GitHub, or can you share it, please? Uh, yeah, we've got we've got a setup for the uh, for how to set up like a sample custom webhook. Um, this we're actually showing a development version of KubeCost. So if you want to get that dev version, it's not yet in our like mainline. So, uh, or, or um, so if you just uh, head over to uh, our Slack channel or email team at, we can get you a build with the uh, with the uh, the API that we use in the Spinnaker pipeline. It basically, simplifies another existing API. And that, and to add a little bit more there, that's so it's in our nightly build, um, and then. We are bringing that to production very soon here, and we're actually going to write a blog post um, and share a lot more about the backing architecture and uh, you know like share this code. Um, basically, like this will this code lives in the like open source scoop costs, and so it's really about just like joining Armory and or, or Spinnaker and um, you know that open source uh, scoop costs uh, cost model. Uh, so. Uh, reach out to us, you know, on you know team at kubecost.com or um, you know on our Slack channel if you want to learn more. Um, and again, we're we're almost at time, but I think we've answered all the questions. So thank you everybody for for joining today, and you know, thanks for the great questions. Uh, hope it was helpful. Um, again, reach out at any point if anyone does have questions, and we're going to share more and more content on this. Um, and also really just the starting point between, you know, Coop costs and Spinnaker integrations. Um, we've got, like we hinted to, a, another of, a number of other APIs uh, and insights that we plan on integrating. And so if you do have a particular, you know, use case in mind you want to see, uh, we're really interested because, again, we're going to be uh, doing more uh, engineering work here that's, that's hopefully interesting to everyone. Oh, we've got one. Last question here from Phil. Um, what are examples, uh, improvements in, in dollars or, or spend? Um, Phil, not sure if you're able to answer any or, or like provide any more context there. Um, I'll, I'll try to like answer it to the best I can, but um, you know, we regularly tem see teams uh, reduce spend by 30 plus percent. Um, with going kind of through this exercise and, and leveraging other insights and in coop costs. Um, but we've seen that be like well above 50% in our experience. Um, and this can be a, a combination of you know, right sizing workloads like we've showed, you know, identifying abandoned workloads, um, you know, applying auto scaling, you know, right sizing clusters, et cetera, et cetera. We've got about you know 15 to 20 different like insights in the Coop Costs uh, product, all in the community version, um, that are you know available kind of depending on your context or how you configured your 
your cluster and all of the like workloads in it. So let us know if we can share more there. Uh, but again, super grateful for everyone joining today. Hope it was useful in some capacity. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for having us. Hope every ha everybody has a great day. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for coming.